<laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. And we've all worked for just about all the major publishers in the business. We've all published together somewhere around 50 or 70 books. And we've all taught illustration at university art school programs. That is correct. Each week we pick a different topic in illustration. We take questions from people just like you, try to answer them as best we can. Sometimes we're going to fight. Sometimes we're going to uh, uh, agree. But each time you're going to learn something brand spanking new. Brand spanking new. All right. F- follow up from last week. Uh, last week we got a uh, question from Beverly and her I don't know if you remember, but um, her thing was like, seriously, how do I get work? And we talked about it. We answered it. But one of the things we couldn't, we couldn't fully answer it without seeing what her work looked like, because that is like, that's a huge factor in whether you could do everything right and not get work because maybe your artwork doesn't, doesn't match the kind of work you're trying to get. Right. And And I don't, I don't say that like, you have to be a great artist to get work because there are artists who have very rudimentary rudimentary skill, but they've leaned in hard on not being able to draw well. Um, Like I think about Mr. Doodle. Do you guys know Mr. Doodle? I don't know if you've seen his, he's got like two or 3 million followers on Instagram. We don't have little kids at home. I, I, I do. You don't have to have little kids to be into Mr. Doodle. He's, he makes art (laughs) for the masses, not for kindergartners. I don't have, I don't have little kids either. All my kids are in the double digit age, age range now. You sound defensive. I am. (laughs) am Don't get so triggered, bro. Don't get so triggered. (laughs) (laughs) It's just the little kid thing is such a slog and and we're over with it. It's so so nice. It really is. (laughs) Anyway, Mr. Doodle, look him up. What the guy does is he has like one style. He uses these thick markers that are like an inch wide, two inches wide. And he draws the most simplest iconic things like stars and squares and triangles. And then he'll make faces out of them. And he'll do an entire like 50 foot wall covered in these doodles. And it's, and it actually, each individual doodle isn't great, you know, isn't like an amazing piece of artwork, but the, the, the effect of it being plastered everywhere is art, right? It is something magnificent. And so what I'm, I'm, what I'm saying there is if you, you have to play to your strengths and lean into what you can do in order to get work as an artist. And maybe that means you have to really be rock solid in figure drawing in light and shadow and all these fundamentals because you want to get a job doing book illustration, book covers. But if if you sort of want to, you know, maybe do a web comic where the drawings just need to look funny, but they don't need to, you know, you don't have to be able to draw likenesses very well or do light and shadow, then maybe that's what you lean into. All of that is groundwork for um for what I guess our advice, our follow-up advice to Beverly Hill, he, Beverly here. So, what do you think, Will? Well, she sent us um, her her Instagram and her website, and if I were looking, if I were going to rate, you know, every artist from you know the people that are trying to be pros, the people that are starting out, let's say, mm-hmm. well, let's say even college students all the way up to the the very top professionals. And let's say we gave a scale of one to 10. Um, Lee, where would you put Beverly's work? Scale of one to 10. um, I'm going to be honest. See how I deflected there? (laughs) It's a good deflection, but I'm okay. I mean, I've I've taught enough to where it's all, we're all friends here. You know what I mean? I don't need to try to candy coat anything. I I, I don't think, I don't think the work is ready for prime time yet. Um, I I, I would, I, I, I would go three. Three. Two or three. Yeah, three. three. And and maybe four on some of the pieces. But um, your your work needs to be, to get consistent work, it needs to be in the seven to eight range. To get, mm-hmm. to always be busy, you need to be in the nine or the ten. And so what, what you really need to do, Beverly, is 
is take your best piece and do that nine grid that we talk about a lot. Put yours in the middle and the eight images around the sides, put your favorite illustrators and really start to define the things that you're lacking. Um, we could, let's list th three things that we think that she could improve on. Let me do a little crit. Can I do a crit? Sure. I'm just going to look at her at the, at the front, at the top three. I'm looking at the Instagram page. Um, number one, the, so she's got, she's more so a character designer kind of portfolio than a, or not even character designer, character artist, um, type look versus an illustrator. An illustrator, we've, we've been really hitting this point the past couple of weeks, and I think we should continue on this, that an illustrator is a storyteller. You, mm -hmm. are, you are saying something. It's not just that you're drawing something, but you're saying something mm -hmm. in the drawing. Uh, in this case, uh, at least in the, the first six that I'm seeing up here, it's literally just a character, and the character is just in the dead center of the frame, and so, so the composition's not great, it's just a character, and they're not really doing anything. That's the problem. It's like, unless I love the way this character was drawn, mm -hmm. I, I literally have nothing to do here. There's nothing for me to, to, to take away from this artwork. So I can see it and say, oh yeah, she's pretty good. Um, and, and, and that's about it. I mean, they're, they're, they're drawn okay. It's a little bit chalky in terms of technical painting, using a little bit too much white, and what happens a lot in the beginning stages of painting is you're over-highlighting a lot of the objects, and which means you're just adding too much white to it if you're painting it traditionally. Uh, but just everything's lit a little too bright. But my, my main problem is that, that there's nothing happening in the images. It's just mm -hmm. a standalone character, and they're looking out at the at the viewer. Yeah, so so if I'm a art director um, or an editor, I, I have to see and have confidence that you're going to be able to um, illustrate my project, which is almost... I mean, you, you talked about getting work in a lot of different areas, you're, you're really better off focusing on one or two markets and really strategizing your portfolio for those. And so, you know, I'm looking on Instagram and it, it's all over the place between, um, fan art and, um, and, and like Lee said, you know, some character designs, and then there are some illustrations lower, but they, they're, they're not really telling, they're not telling stories that I would imagine being in um, in children's books. That you know, I'm, I'm not seeing things that remind me of illustration work. One of the things that, that I would say you need to do is give yourself assignments that look like they were done for something, so that when someone sees them, they're like, "Oh, that's an interesting story going on in that thing. What was it for?" Whereas these don't make me think that a lot of them are greeting card type illustrations. Greeting card market is really tough because everybody wants to make decorative pieces and there's really low bar for entry on telling non-narrative, uh, I mean, making non-narrative art. It's, it's just so, I hate to say the word easy, but it, but a greeting card can use any kind of an image. I mean, they can, they, Greeting card companies can get images from people that have they, that, that have already been done. They don't need to commission them. You know, they they can look on Instagram and say, "Hey, can I use your your piece of art for a greeting card?" So it would not be something that I would advertise for. Do you guys disagree with that? No, no. I, don't, I don't disagree. Okay. I'm looking at it, and what I'm seeing, what she really has dialed in, is all the surface stuff, all the facade that goes over the top of you know the real fundamentals which she she doesn't have so it's like she knows how to use the right textures she knows how to do the right photoshop filters she, i mean colors the color choices aren't bad um the line work you know coloring the line work and and all of these like things that you but maybe i would do or these other illustrators would do the last 10 percent to really make their thing like glow and, and sing, she knows how to do. Mm -hmm. But what she's missing is the 90% of the life drawing. Like I'm looking at this and I just don't see an understanding of like structure, like how to turn a head at a third, you know, uh, at a three fourths angle or to arch a head up, you know, understanding like how a hand attaches to an arm, attaches to an elbow, attaches to a shoulder, like just basic understanding of, of life drawing would go 
so far with these drawings. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I just see, I see like, I see these things that if she just had a better understanding of, you know, where a character sits in three dimensional space compared to other things and where mm-hmm. body parts exist in three dimensional space compared to other body parts, it would, it would, I think it would take it to the next, take her right up to that, that six, seven, eight level mm-hmm. where she needs to be. I think yeah. I think it's um, I think that's true. All that's true. But I think even fixing that, we're going to be left with a problem. I was looking for this image that I wanted to show you guys, but I don't know if I can find it's, it. It's um, so much about story. It's about story. I was going to pull. I was going to pull up this image that I did real early in my career. I think I'd done one or two books, um, but I got commissioned to do this um, magazine, uh, like four or five illustrations for like a spider magazine or cricket or something like that, and it was. Uh, it was called The Button Lady. And it was about, it was sort of this fairy tale about this lady who comes to town and returns everybody's lost buttons. Mm -hmm. And it was a super fun story. And the the reason I bring it up, I don't know why I I thought of that image specifically, is that because it's so specific to this like sort of fantasy character that has this specific, uh, um, not skill, but a specific kind of nuance that she brings all the buttons back, it, create, it caused me to have to create an extremely specific kind of character. And I made her out of coll- all these collage buttons and stuff like that. And the reason I think of it is it's so specific to the story that all of a sudden the work had to all be specific. And all of a sudden, so if you see these images, you will know they go to something. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm just gonna draw a character today. It was, it's such specific work because, oh, here it is, I found it, I'll share it with you guys. Um, you wanna give me sharing privileges? <laughs> we sharing on don't on do the it podcast? don't do it jake can we do that because you guys can see what we're doing on uh on youtube if you go right. if you go check it yeah. out i don't even know if you guys have seen this but i would never i would just privileges. never have made this image in a million years if this was the kind of the lead-in thing and then the, the type in the beginning mm. of the story was over to the mm. side this is the button lady and um it's just a specific kind of image and not saying that it's a great image or, or, or an image that I couldn't improve on. It's just really specific. Mm-hmm. Um, and all the stories, uh, all the images from the story went like that. And any story, it's not just specific to this one here. I'll stop sharing now. Any story you pick is going to have its own very, very specific nuance. And that's just what's missing here. There is no specificity to these characters. There's no reason for them to be on the page. There's no reason for them to do anything. And that's why the characters don't look like they're doing anything. They're, there's there's mm-hmm. no reason for them to be there other than, hey, I'm going to draw a character. Um, so is, I, I, I'm beating a dead so horse probably, but let I me just ask you guys this: home. Is art is 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 becoming a full time freelance successful illustrator about a kumbaya with other artists, or is it a death match, cage match? It's a, it's a struggle. <laughs> It's a it's struggle. A, I mean, it's a even constant internally. Battle. It's a cage match. You have to be so much better than the next. You have to make you have to make your portfolio look to the point where the art director is like, "Dang, if I don't use this person, I might look bad because I'll have to use someone else." <laughs> you know? I, yeah. Well, I don't. I don't know. A cage match is a good good thing, but I like to think of it as like an ecosystem, right? So. If you want to live like in the jungle and hunt what tigers hunt and you're you know, a kitten or a cat, you're not going to survive very well, you know, in that jungle. The tigers will will eat everything and tear you apart, right? Mm-hmm. But if you're a house cat or a neighborhood cat and you want to live in a neighborhood, there's plenty of birds, there's plenty of little mice running around. You can... you. It's like you have to find, and you could thrive. Like I see some really healthy, fat cats in my neighborhood, right? You could thrive there, but those cats wouldn't survive in the jungle, right? Mm. So I think what you do is you find an ecosystem where you can thrive and you do work that that fits there. So like for me, I am not good at painting. I could not do like lifelike painting like... Um, um, uh, you know, like Howard Lyon, right? I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but he does, he does um, uh, He's the an cards, amazing artist. the card series of uh, uh, what's, what's now my my brains. It's like that playing card game where you have fantasy characters on the cards. Magic, mm-hmm. Magic the Gathering, right? He does stuff like that. I'm not the guy for that, 
But if you need me to draw Rocket Raccoon, like cool sci-fi, heavy inked line stuff, uh, and Howard was going to try to do that, I'd school Howard at Rocket the Raccoon, mm-hmm. right? Meanwhile, he could draw like he could paint a portrait and 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 just just kill it. And I'm you know I'm sitting here finger painting, you know, compared to him, right? So the thing is, is you have to find your niche and and lean in hard on that and just embrace it and not you know sort of keep blinders on you can look at other stuff for inspiration but i do not have aspirations to go do magic the gathering cards because i know i'd be terrible at it so mm-hmm. i'm trying to follow a path where i know i know i could win and so i'm like that that house cat that's like going out and hunting birds instead of a tiger that's going out and trying to bring down a like a buffalo or whatever they whatever tigers hunt what do tigers eat what do they tuna hunt? tuna fish tuna fish yes. that's right Sa- they, salmon they, <laughs> well, sometimes they'll, they'll swim out and they'll hunt the tuna fish. That's from the. the so other guys. I, I go Sorry back to that. It's all but, right. I go back to Beverly's stuff and like she did this um, this countdown for Christmas, where anytime she does like really nice patterns or basic basic shapes, like she did these mittens and she did this Christmas tree and she did these gingerbread houses, awesome. all that stuff is. I would say in the eight, you know, seven, eight range for, Mm -hmm. for uh, an art director who's looking for, you know, like a greeting card company or a, um, a paper company or a rat, you know, wrapping paper or, or material like, like for quilting and things like that, you'll be getting work all day long if you have a portfolio that is leaning in hard to that. But when I see the character design stuff, you're not going to get a job at Disney until you understand life drawing, until you understand light and shadow a little bit better. And so, um, and so it's, I think it's kind of figuring out a accepting who you are as an artist and what your abilities are, like just kind of giving into that. Mm -hmm. But then once you accept it, like going hard on that. Right. And, or having such an eye of a tiger, type of drive inside of you that you're going to learn, you're going to like learn stuff, you know, like work so hard to learn all the things that you don't know so that you can compete at the level, you know, and be like a Brittany Lee or a, yeah. or a Pernell, right? Yeah. Look at Brittany Lee. If you're not already looking at her, I, I remember being in a situation where, you know, three, two or three years out of school working full-time as an illustrator because I was getting work, I thought I had arrived. I mean, I thought mm-hmm. I was the stuff. Mm-hmm. And and I, the, my work was, the, the, what's crazy is most of my, my college students are so much better than I was five, five years out of school while mm-hmm. they're in school right now. I was so bad and I thought I was so good. And it's, sometimes it's really hard to know where you fit in. And that's why I say, you know, right now your work is probably in the three range, it's probably really hard to hear that, but there are, are a lot of things. And if you want, you can contact me and I can give you some more specifics. One thing I would suggest is drawing bigger, bigger. Um, it, it looks like in some of these character designs that they're drawn really small and it doesn't allow you to really handle the anatomy if you're drawing too small. Mm. Um, so like fingers are, are, uh, they, they still need to have the gesture fingers and hands. They need to have the right proportion, the right, the right, uh, the, the right fingery gestures and, um, and they're tough, but you've got to master those hands. Um, and anyway, I think we've, we've, yeah, but to be clear, like the character stuff is in the three range, like her understanding of color palettes and like pattern and design that is, I think professional. And if she leaned into that, she'd easily be getting the kind of, you know, getting work for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think a a good composition class uh, and a good just storytelling class and then, and then picking narratives that generate that kind of work. Like I was mm -hmm. saying about the button lady or something that just has a specific kind of story. Those three things together would fix almost all these problems in my opinion. Cause I agree with you guys that she can, she already has the kind of the veneer on top. Uh, I'd agree with Jake, yeah. a little bit more drawing mileage. But if I go the, all the way back in the Instagram, she is getting a lot better 
Um, yeah, there's a lot. That, that, that brings up some good questions because there's a there's a woman with the sweater, the red sweater, mm-hmm. with the the like moose on it that are, is really nice. Um, and um, so so her Instagram is really inconsistent. Um, what do you guys think about like p- post every day or post once a week and with super quality when you're starting out? Cause, cause if I'm an art director, I, I see a weak piece and I'm like, I don't want to get a weak piece for uh, my In, the, in this case, I don't think she's close enough to worry about the art director yet. Either okay. one of those would be fine with me. I think right now the focus should be off of, oh, I need work. And the focus should be on, I got to fix these sort of these gaps in my skill set. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. once she's got that, maybe even starting a new Instagram that is the pro Instagram. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, keep this for sketches yeah. and stuff on the side. Beverly Pro, at Beverly Pro. <laughs> you guys, we do crits for anybody at, how much would we charge for a three-person, one-hour crit, you guys? Nothing right now, because we don't have it set up. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Don't be emailing us, everybody saying, okay, do mine, do mine. <laughs> it's $10,000. No, let's do it. What's, what's our line? Ten grand. You know, we should do, maybe that's where we do, we do those on the show, um, that's what Dave Ramsey does, right? People call in and they give him their yeah, portfolio. Yeah, but his is in, like, okay, but you can you can talk about that though. It's a, it's a it's a audible you know yeah. narrative kind of thing. But we would need to like people to see it. Maybe we do a separate mm-hmm. little YouTube. thing because that would be that would be a lot of fun to do well, a YouTube thing where people sign in and we do a three person crit as best we can. We did do that for years. It was called Third Thursday, and then <laughs> oh yeah, it, and nobody it showed it up. Turned, it turned into <laughs> Critique Arena, right? Um, we're so, yeah, so it That's turned true. into Arena. So, I mean, it yeah, join us on showed up. We had, Arena. we had okay. I mean, we had stuff to review right. every week or every third Thursday. No, it was good. We got a couple hundred people each time. Okay, yeah. okay. Next question: uh, Trade versus commercial publishing. This comes from Kaisa, uh, who I believe is in Sweden. It definitely sounds like a yes. Yeah, she says she's in Sweden. Kaisa is a Swedish name. First of all, you guys are awesome. Thank you. We appreciate that. We're always going to read that if it's in a letter. <laughs> <laughs> or we write it I, in if you didn't. Right. I've learned and keep <laughs> learning so much from you. Thank you for everything that you do. So for my question, I thought it'd be interesting to hear your take on the difference between trade and commercial publishing. Um, she says, I recently learned more about it, but it's still a little bit bleary and not as clearly divided here in Sweden. What would you say is the difference in terms of styles topics or stories can an illustrator be successful in both or is it better to focus on one Uh, also i've heard there's more money in trade publishing is this true so trade versus commercial first off what is the difference what are those things for people who don't know i go i go deep on this one i got a lot of go for a lot of opinions you guys will just have to stop me because i'm just going to keep talking until you do um trade (laughs) typically is a book that you would see in a book book store. Um, Amazon has kind of muddied the water here because it's online. And so you get a lot of it together, whereas it used to be separated a little bit. Um, but the, the name trade comes from, these are books that, that are so, sold to the trade, like booksellers, wholesalers. Um, they typically sell books to the direct to the public. Um, trade books tend to be uh, you know, like your top five publishers, the big five that are in New York, they typically deal in trade. They, now, some of them do have a commercial division, mass market division, um, but these are this is where the bigger money is. This is where the um, uh, typically trade publishers pay a royalty out to their authors. So it'll be like an adva- and illustrators, authors and illustrators, you get an advance against that royalty. And so these are the ones that if you have like a Harry Potter level book, can make an author or an illustrator very, very wealthy. Um, the quality tends to be higher. There's more effort on advertising these individual titles, and each one of them I kind of think of it like the, almost like a like a like a film. Like each one of them has the capacity to do well on its own, and it mm-hmm. can be marketed on its own. It's not a big, typically not a huge series. Although sometimes, in especially in middle grade, it does become a series, or even in children's books, can become a series. Um, so that's that's the big deal. Typically, those why is trade it books called are, trade? Because it's sold to the trade, to booksellers, schools, and or uh, booksellers mainly, but it's also marketed to the libraries as well. That's a big market for trade, and that's that that's the big that's where trade got its name. Now, now the other opposite side of that is 
called either commercial, I think that's how it's referred to here, or mass market. Mm -hmm. um, those mm -hmm. are books, uh, they're, they're sold to supermarkets, drug stores, mall stores. Uh, sometimes they're in um, little uh, book clubs and things like that. Walmart. They're typic yeah, they're typically mass market books. They're less expensive. There is less emphasis on individual titles. A lot of times they're, they're, they can be education, a little bit more educational in nature. The big thing for us as artists is they typically are work for hire. And work for hire means you're doing the work and the copyright has been taken from you. You will never see a royalty. It is a flat fee type project. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, that, and sometimes, that's it. Sometimes you don't even, you can't even see who the artist is. It's not even credited on there. That's right. That's you know, right. Why, why do I feel like I know less name. about why it's called trade now than I did before you? You explained it, Lee. <laughs> what did you think trade meant? Like, were you just trade them with your friends, like trading cards? It, it, so, Where does it mean do you know, anything to me? Do you know what the name? Do you know what the word trade means, like in general? Like, yeah, it's yeah. I think so, so. The, so there we go. <laughs> welcome, <laughs> welcome to my TED talk. <laughs> I fully understand now. I I, I apologize for not understanding. Think about this. Well, it's just sold to the trade. It's a trade book. That's what it's it's where it ends up. They it's needed a name. I got it. It's sold to the So bookstore. they just picked the word trade out of the word uh, trade could be interchangeable with bookstore book. Yeah. I got you. Yeah, you know, that's that's kind of what it is. I, it's, what's but funny the, is I've heard them called that for 30 years and I'm like I had to make I had to make you explain it the way you did <laughs> so that people would realize that they too know that you're full of it. Oh, you saying I'm wrong? <laughs> no, not that you're wrong. Just that the, the explanation makes no sense. But oh, I agree. I mean, is it? It's a. It's not a great name. I, I mean, I'll, <laughs> right. I'll, I'll agree one hundred percent there. Um, <laughs> but the the question, I guess, for us is: Is there ever a time to do one of the mass markets uh, over just sticking with the trade? I'm gonna. I, I can't answer that for everybody, but I will throw out some general guidelines. My general thoughts are. If you could get a book in mass market, like typically educational books are easier to get than trade books. They cost less for the publisher to produce mm -hmm. and, and there's there's less risk for them. So the chances of you getting offered an educational book over a or a trade book, it's, it's way higher that you're going to get a mass market book or a commercial educational book. Mm -hmm. um, if you get the chance to do it, you have no work under your name. I'm thinking you're a new illustrator. You've never done a book. You get the offer and you can do it in a style that moves you forward. Now you're not going to get paid. Your rights are going to be taken. So hopefully your name is yeah, going to be so on the cover. So it's going to be a work for hire. It's going to be a work for hire. But if you can get a good book out of it, then I would say thumbs up because the goal of the early illustrator is to get some projects done so you can prove that you're worthy to do it. Now the pro the, the, the problem there is it, it's kind of weird. The less money that a uh, publisher will pay and the kind of the lower profile the job is, the more control that they tend to take on the project, which means they wrangle the ability to get a good project from you. Mm -hmm. They give you a lot of notes. Like I remember the first couple that I was offered to do, I turned them down, but it had illustration notes on every page, exactly what I'm drawing. Like there's a dog in the upper right. He's coming in. There's a bone down there. He's in a red <laughs> dog house. I mean, I didn't even really get a chance. to wouldn't have had a chance to do anything. And so for me, I said, is this going to move my career forward or not? And I said, no, that it's not. And I, I decided to go trade. As a matter of fact, I have talked about it on this podcast before, but I had an offer to do a full alphabet series and it was 100 grand total plus 100 grand plus, you know, and at the time I was making no money. I just graduated from, from college and I got offered and it was one of these educational type things. I was not going to have royalty rights. Um, I would have my name on there, but they were just having, there was a lot of handholding and I wouldn't have ended up with a product that moved my career forward and I ended up turning it down and they hated me forever. But um, <laughs> but I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I made the choice and I went to the trade industry. But if you can get something good uh, out of it, then I say do it. It's not a loss, but I'll, the, uh, the one other last thing I'll add, because I'm talking a lot, is what tends to happen is an, an illustrator takes a, takes a mass market book or an educational book and the company realizes, hey, this person is going to do this work, which is you know terrible pay, terrible rights. And then they just start asking, hey, you, we got another book. Do you want to do it? Do you want to do it? You want to do it? All of a sudden, five years have passed and you've done only educational work. Mm -hmm. So if you do it, plan to get out quick. It's just a, it's just a quick loss leader sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Get a portfolio piece and get out. I know. I actually know someone who ha has had a very lucrative career in children's books, but he's 
completely unknown because he got I don't want to name the series because I don't think it's fair to him. He didn't he hasn't given me permission for this. But there's a there's a very big um um a series of books out there that everyone has heard of. Uh-huh. <laughs> and this the the guy, I will say this, the original il- author illustrator is is from the UK. The the guy who is hired to do all the books that he didn't want to do it here, is here in the U.S. and that's that's the friend of mine, and um, he's made a great living because he's done dozens of books in this series under this name, and they're like this character, you know. So the book is about a character, and it, it's about a cat, and and <laughs> it's a, don't but don't, <laughs> but anyway he. He he uh, hmm. he's I he's done what all, book it is. He's done all <laughs> these books, and he's like, "Well, how do I get out of this? You know, because I like I'm not getting my own stuff. I'm not promoting my name. Should I keep doing this? Um, mm-hmm. And but he's making great money doing it. Uh, I mean, good money. Um, not getting royalties, but but it was easy for him, and he could work digitally and just bang them out. Is uh, is the is it the is the cat? Happen? Does he? Is the cat orange? No. Does he like lasagna? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not that one. <laughs> Not that cat. Yeah. All right. Is, is the cat does, blue? Does, does the cat wear a mustache? Does he? <laughs> I'm going to try and figure out. It space. must be frustrating to listen to this episode because you were, people aren't <laughs> able to see the Instagram account we were looking at. They don't know who this cat illustrator is. <laughs> So what's the long and short of this, this, uh, answering this question? Should you, we, we've, we've talked about the difference. Should you follow one path or the other? I, my thing is, um, do whatever you got to do to make money. Um, but always leave something for yourself, like have some project, something you're trying to get going, something you're trying to like, like get up off and, you know, get up into the air. Um, that is for yourself that you really believe in, you know, that's maybe a long shot, uh, but it really comes down to your sensibility, something that only you could create and just have that thing going. But you also have to survive somehow. And if you can get work doing something, absolutely get work to it, get work doing it. Um, sometimes I, the advice I give is maybe, maybe you get a day job that has nothing to do with art. So that you can put all pour all your creativity into this project that you believe in, this personal project you believe in, that might be a path. But if you could do, you know, if you could do a hundred um, commercial books, and it pays your rent for a couple of years, so that you can do this other thing, knock yourself out, go for it. Um, that's and, and again, that's only if you have like desires to do your own thing. If it's just to use your art to make work, then maybe maybe you follow that path and you just do commercial books and you become known as like, you know, this mercenary who just, we need a, we just need an illustrator to put marks on a page and uh, they're not going to get credit, but they are going to get paid. And maybe that's the path you want to follow. So you kind of have to figure out what you want to do and, you know, what ideally where you want to be and, um, and chart a course that leads you towards that. So I don't know if doing a hundred commercial books is going to translate into you doing your own thing. You might learn a lot about that. You might be able to, you know, see what trends are, see what works, what sells, and you might make something on your own from doing all those. That's very commercial and very successful. Uh, I think about, do you ever, you know, the band, um, they did pump up kicks. I think they're mm-hmm. called Foster the People. Mm-hmm. Pumped up. Do you, you, do you know the story of that the guy who did that? Mm-mm. So he had a full career in commercials, making music for commercials, and so he instantly like I don't know if he instantly, but like he knew over the years of what was catchy, what people you know, what songs, what sounds, what beats, what rhythms, what chords, all that stuff like get people going, um, you know, stick their head. And he went and made his own album, uh, created a band, own album, Foster the People. And immediately, like, that thing 
just skyrocketed. People loved it. People, you know, he was then licensing the songs for commercial and stuff like that. So that's just another thing I thought of. It's like, maybe you spend all this time making commercial stuff and it influences and affects something that you can make um, in trade that will, uh, that could be super successful because of what you learned on that side. So mm. and it's, I, it, this is one of those things where it's like, I need to know the path and we're like, well, here's the layout of the land. Here's a map. Here's where the mountains are. Here's where the valleys are. You know, here's where the pits are that you want to avoid. And we kind of need you to look at that map and figure out where you want to go on that map to get to that destination. And I think that's that's one of the problems with asking advice is a lot of times people are asking for directions to places other people have never been, though they've seen, you know, they've seen those places. And so mm-hmm. I think what you do is you just you just take advice and you sort of chart a course based on the landscape that, you you know, more information on this landscape that you're getting. So I want to talk about scammers who like prey on artists. Have you guys ever had to deal with that? Have you ever had something like that happen to you? Okay, so I found this email from 2019. The reason I bring this up is because a guy contacted me on Instagram. He's a um, uh a guy who's been following me over the years, sort of friends, like social media friends, I guess. And he's like, hey, I just want to warn you about this thing that that happened, this scam that happened. And it reminded me of this earlier scam that I had to deal with, um, that I, I get these emails from time to time. And I just want to bring this up so that people know what to, what to look out for, okay? And so this is the email I got. And usually it's titled something like artwork needed or interest in artwork or something like that. Um, I mean, actually, I could look at some of the, the, that's, the things That's here. funny. I wondered if that was what you were going to talk about because I still have a $6,000 check from one of these. Oh, yep. This is the one. Yep. So Peace Inquiry is another. So I get this email. Hello, my name is Robert Kane from Washington. I was looking. So right there. You know, you know, this guy sounds like uh, uh, some sort of, um, you know, tech investor guy up there in Seattle. He's got money. All right. I was looking for some artwork online and I found your contact while searching. I would like to purchase some of your work for my wife as a surprise gift for our 20th anniversary. Anniversary. Kindly send pics and pieces of some of your art, which are ready for immediate sale with a price range of 500 to 5000 I could be flexible with the price. So you, you're getting this email and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I, I finally- I'm going to figure out how to get 5,000, obviously, yeah, is what you're thinking. Yeah, like I'm, someone's finally taking notice. Yeah. Um, so I hope to hear a lot more about any available piece in your inventory ready for immediate sale. And so there's a sense of urgency here. Like he is ready, he's hot, he's got his finger on, you know, on the button. You can email me and he gives his email for quick response. Thanks. Thanks and best regards, Robert. I, I'm i like, okay, anybody who knows my work knows that I'm not selling stuff for $5,000. I've never sold a piece for $5,000, right? So um, so I'm, I'm, I think it's a little fishy. Also, whose wife is, is cruising through my website saying, hey, I'd like to, I'd like to buy this, you know, original Rocket Rat, Raccoon page for, for my anniversary, right? Like, well, even, even that, the, even, the, even that though would be a little less fishy because there's some specificity there. Uh-huh. Like I, what, what, what would raise the red flag for me is just, it's just general, like, Hey, I like this art. I mean, nobody shops for artwork that way. Like I'll take anything this person does. Right. You know what I mean? It's, it's just totally it's generic. So not specific. So then I replied, thank you for your interest. I have a bunch of different styles and pieces. Perhaps you could send me a link to something that I've done that looks like something your wife would like, and then I can see if I have something like that available. And so he replies and says, send me any picture and price for the ones you've got, then I can select. And I said, nope, you pick. Here's my website and Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and he never he never followed up, and that's where, mm. that's where it ended. So here's how this scam works, though. Here's how it goes to the next level. So let's say... 
I am like, sweet. I sent them three pictures. Here's these pieces. And they replied, say, great, I'll take them all. Uh, or I'll take one of them. And I'll send you 5,000 for that middle one. Mm-hmm. Um, here's the address. Mail it ASAP. The anniversary's next week. Uh, yeah, so I got to get them now. I got to get them now. And I'll send a courier to your house. There's a courier involved, right? Mm. There could be, or it could be like, I'll I'll cover the shipping and the check. I'm expediting a check to you right away so you get the money. All right. So then you receive the check. Is it a check or a wire? At, it's, it's, it's a, a check. check. It's an actual okay, check. And it's not you a receive wire, a check. So I'm curious. And you're looking at it and you're, and you're like, sweet. He threw in, he said he'd throw in some extra money for shipping. There's an extra thousand dollars there. This guy's legit. Let's do this. So you go, you deposit that check right away. And, and they're telling you, you know, deposit this as soon as you can. Right. Mm-hmm. So you go deposit it. Then you get a message that same day, because they know when the check arrived or they know, you know, it's the timing is so tight in this. And they say, oh, my gosh, um, I didn't mean to send you six thousand. I only meant to send you, you know, a certain a certain amount. Could you please wire me back? Just wire me back, not send a check. Wire me back X amount of dollars. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry. I apologize you know, let's take care of this. So then you wire it back. And then two weeks later, the bank calls you and says, Hey, that check bounced. And so, and then they're gone and you can never contact again. So that's how they get money from you. So it's an overage kind of thing. It's whatever mm -hmm. that overage is amount that they're taking off with. They they count on the fact that they've flattered you Mm -hmm. about your artwork. Mm -hmm. Then they're paying you so much extra that you don't mind sending them a a wire for 500 bucks. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. but they're not, the, the check that I got was not real. Um, it looked like a check. It mm-hmm. masked. Was it from a real check. bank? What was no, it? It's not, it's, it's, it's a Fugazi. It's, it's not anything. Right. It's it, any, and so anyway, um, the, the one <laughs> I'll tell you really quick. I have a friend, you know, my friend Wayne, he gets these. And for a while he was, <laughs> he would he would scam them back, which was a waste of his time, but he would do it just, oh, it's to, worth it. just to mess with them. So what he would do is because they fed. No, here's the why check. it's good, because any time you waste of theirs is time taken away from scamming other people. True. So well, what he would do is he would say, um, OK, yeah, send me the check. And he knows they're they're It's going to be bogus. He gets them excited. And then, mm-hmm. like, you know, like they've got a live one on the line. And then he comes up with these excuses of. His his um, wife was taking out the trash and she thought that I had gotten the check out of that FedEx thing mm-hmm. and she threw it away and I am so sorry and he just goes through all these and, and then so they send another the, one yeah then the next thing is well be careful it it cost us money to send FedEx you know <laughs> and so he's like I will I'm sorry so they send another one oh and he's gosh. actually gotten three he's been so really good, good. like uh, I most love of the Wayne. time you can only get two so anyway I, I want you know what there should. You and Wayne should start a podcast. That would be hilarious. <laughs> Wayne has We'd so get arrested. many, so many stories. That's true. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Anyways, okay. So then there's a another version of this. All right, and this other version. I was reading online a little bit, doing some research to see the different variants. So now they've they've some of them moved on from checks to, I'll pay you with PayPal. And so hmm. they ask for your PayPal email address. And so you send them that because that's how you send money to PayPal, type in the email. So then not long after that, you will get a code on your phone or in your email or it says, here's your PayPal code. They'll reply to you and say, hey, I'm having trouble sending this money. You might have gotten a code. Can you just send me that code? What that code is for a password reset. And oh. what they're doing is they're logging in. I forgot my password. The code is got sent to your thing. You're sending that code. They log it in. They they put it in there. And now they've changed the password and they have access to your PayPal account and they can clean you out that way. Wow. So watch so out crafty. for that. Right. Okay. And then this third one. This, so this is this is a friend of mine who who messaged me uh, on Instagram. He says, uh, "I just want you to know, I I." Um, I narrowly escaped 
escaped one. So this is another version of it. And instead of um, flattering you, like, I want to buy your paintings, they're going more towards like working illustrator types, um, f- freelancers, things like that. So this is what he says. I was approached by someone I didn't know through Facebook Messenger about creating five full color illustrations for a pr- presentation on the coronavirus. So imagine mm-hmm. you get that. That sounds totally legit. Like, mm-hmm. it's not my wife who who loves comic art and, uh, and it's our 20th <laughs> anniversary and I want to get her <laughs> something. It is, <laughs> you know, it's very specific. Like, hey, I've got a job. Are you available? Sweet. You know, people are looking for work during uh, Corona. It's hard to get work as an artist sometimes. So uh, he says, they asked for a quote. I worked one up. They sent a check but said it came from their investor who mistakenly sent me the whole amount, theirs and mine. So now this check is like double what it should be. And you're sitting here with a, you know, you know, you, you quote them $3,000 for the job. They send $6,000 and they're like, <laughs> shoot, you know, what, what can you do? And they said their hope was I would deposit it and send them the balance. If I had, he says, if I had the check, it would have bounced and I would have been on the hook for the check. I sent back to him with the balance. So that's essentially their way of, of doing the same grift to like get that money back, you know, mm-hmm. sent back to them. So I just want to sh- share this as sort of like a, a public service announcement to watch out for scams. Um, typically, uh, I think some of the things you're going to want to like watch out for is um, like being very specific or not very specific, being very general not really paying attention to what kind of art you're creating, being very urgent. Like if it's immediate and things need to be happening quick, 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 that's another thing to watch out for. Mm-hmm. Um, typically, you know, typically if it's a if it's a freelance job or something like that, like there's time worked into the budget to find a freelancer to work on it and you should have a runway there. Um, so I would just just watch out for that, read up, you know, do searches, share stuff on, on, on social media and see if anybody else has, has done that and just kind of be like, uh, cognizant and aware of, of some of these things that are that And are just happening. know that if it sounds like it's so out of the blue and so different than anything you ever get, and it sounds mm-hmm. too good to be true, usually. Right. It usually is. Yeah. That said, I did have an out of the blue, little bit of a windfall one day. Where a guy, um, it was it was a guy who I think just had um, some some tech money or something because he did live in in Silicon Valley area, and he contacted me and said, "Hey, I really love this comic story you made. We're decorating a children's bedroom, and I'd like a couple of these panels in your comic blown up to this massive." this massive size. And he's like, can I have the digital files for them? And I was like, I was like, sure. And we, we figured out a price. And so for some digital files, you know, I got a really good check for this guy. Mm. Um, and he paid me, um, I want to say he paid me via PayPal and he wasn't asking for any sort of, you know, <laughs> over code or, or anything. Yeah. Or anything. Or... So I mean, I sold, it a, I sold a painting. A while, I, I but, <laughs> I sold a painting yesterday that get the, it's, it's sort of a take on what the scam was you're talking about, but here's the difference. And see if you guys can spot the difference. Here's the email that I got. It says, hi Lee, we visited the factory. That's where my gallery is a few weeks ago and saw your space. My wife fell in love with the painting of the bluish angel ballerina in that beautiful maple frame. Is that still for sale? If so, I couldn't see a price or details as the store was closed. And then it has his, name and a phone number. So you see how different it is? It's almost the same situation, but mm-hmm. there is so much detail that right. is specific to the painting. It's specific to my specific mm-hmm. location. He's asking for details, which I sent it back. And then we worked at the same same deal where it was a, uh, a PayPal invoiced him and he paid it. Mm-hmm. Was in that email that you got, were, were letters capitalized? Was the spelling correct? 
<laughs> yeah, everything, everything was looking, everything looked normal. And, and I mean, it's just, it's, I just wanted to point it out because it's so close, but it's very different actually. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's just so specific to that and to the location. So that means I know he's been there because there's no way you would know that painting is hung in my space. There's not a picture of it online where somebody could like say, okay, I'll just ask yeah. about that one. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not. So I don't know. I mean, the situation is the same. So you really got to read between the lines and say, okay, is this person legit? And then the way that I'm billing him, if he said, if he said, okay, I'm going to wire you some money. No, 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 no. That would be, it would go away. <laughs> if he said he's going to send a check, I would, I would be even be okay with that, but I'd say I'm not sending nothing back and, and I'm surely not sending the painting until it clears the bank. I mean, that right, would be how right. that would work. Right. Exactly. So. That actually leads me to one of our questions. Um, and it, this one comes from Roxana and she asked, or it's, her email's titled, or question's titled, to list prices or not to list prices. So she says, hello, I was just discussing this over, discussing over this with my artist friends and we couldn't get any, we couldn't get to any conclusion. So I was very curious what your opinion on this would be. Should you show your prices on your website or not? How can an artist decide if it's best to show the price per character, background, extra details, etc.? Or on the hand, other hand, is it best to have the client contact you and give them a price depending on the details of the piece? Thank you very much. So they're specifically talking about possibly freelance work, but I think it's also interesting that you had a painting for sale with no price listed next to it. And I know uh, at like- No, my price, cons, my price was listed, but my gallery was closed, so he couldn't oh, see it. Oh, okay. So they, oh. they couldn't see it. Okay, that makes sense. But sometimes at cons, um, I will see, and I've done this myself too, I will see prices not listed. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a bunch of things for sale, but there's no prices listed. So um, my question to you guys is, we'll, we'll take these one at a time. On um, when you're selling stuff at a gallery or at a convention, what's your take on listing prices or not? Always list. I have a huge pet peeve of people not listing the price. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it seems, are you going to change it for each person? You know, I mean, it just, it, I just have mm -hmm. such a skepticism about mm -hmm. that. Just show the price. I mean, we're all there. You're, you're, they're there to sell the thing. That's why they're mm -hmm. at the gallery. Otherwise, it'd be in a museum and not for sale at all. Yeah, and you got to, you got to price it to sell. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, that's the thing. You know, I would always try to come up with a really good value proposition at the conventions that I would do. And I stood behind my prices. I felt like they were priced really well and they, and the, the success prove that you know and mm -hmm. um if you're if you're now i would not oh well, you're taking these one at a time so that's just i'll just leave it at that for i have a counter argument for the con convention thing so i have a i have a friend very successful with mm -hmm. his con business you know him will and which, uh, which is this a young kid no 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 utah a utah artist oh okay anyways no um, and he wouldn't list prices. I don't know if he does now, but early on he wouldn't list prices. And his, his reasoning was, I want them to make a connection with the piece outside of value, like outside of the money thing. Cause he's like, I don't want people to just turn on, you know, turn off and say like, Oh, be turned off because it's, it's out of their price range. And instead he wants them to really be thinking, Oh, this is something I got to have. And when they get to that stage where they ask how much for this, they are more likely to buy it than the person who wanders off, right? Mm. Um, and so that's that's that was an argument for that. And I I worked with that, but uh, and I tried that for a little while. But the, I think the difference was his the things he was selling were a little bit more um, uh, premium, I would say, a little bit more upscale. Mm -hmm. and, and for what you would normally get at a con. And what I was doing was a little bit more schlocky, I would say. I mean, just art books, right? It's like it's a book and 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 some prints and things like that. But my biggest sellers at cons were books, art books. So mm -hmm. um, ultimately, I just started listing my prices. So that's one argument, I would say, for, for not listing a price in I don't that situation. I buy it. I think... I, it in general, I think people, I, myself, if I didn't see prices, I would, I'd probably think, well, it's, it's too much. Uh -huh. and that's why they're not listing it. 
You know, there's uh, never been a time where a price isn't listed and then you find out the price and you're like, oh, that's reasonable. Right. <laughs> that, that's a good point. <laughs> never yeah. happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is just but a me the trying guy that to... you're talking about. If I'm, it, he's our friend, right? Yeah. Well, he lists them now, so obviously it didn't work. Yeah, maybe, maybe so. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, you know, sometimes they disagree. So I just wanted Which to throw you tried it out to there. Come, yeah, you tried to manufacture a controversy there. <laughs> that was <laughs> called fake me controversy. Out. <laughs> called me out. Okay. So what about on your website? You're, you know, let's say, hey, hire me. I'm a character designer or hire me. I'm, you know. I'm oh, God, that's a great, me. that's a great point to bring up during this. I do never list your prices for a service-based thing. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because mm-hmm. because the parameters on every job are so different, you know, and and the some, rights are different. Asking everything. you to illustrate, um, you know, ten different spots of you know objects is so much easier than ten figures, mm-hmm. you know, ten ch- children or ten adults doing different things in various poses, mm-hmm. um, and so there's no way <clears> that I wouldn't even want to charge the same per hour. I wouldn't even right. charge per hour. That's a. No. I mean, we've yeah, already gone down that road before. Hour, but have we yeah, talked about that, that, that on the podcast. Well, now I, you're we, we have. We have. We've <laughs> talked about that on the podcast. But it, but it's. I see it all the time from beginner <laughs> illustrators. They'll say, "I'll do a." Uh, I see sometimes either fan art or or a portrait, and it'll say a black and white portrait, sixty bucks, and in color, it's eighty bucks. And you're just advertising yourself as an amateur right there. That is a. Mm-hmm. That's super underpriced, and then b. Just it, it's just. Like Will said, there's so many variables to what you're providing. The scale you're providing is it an original or a digital file? I mean, all kinds of stuff. Don't list your don't list your prices unless and there's a caveat there. Unless it's uh, commission work. So let's like typically people will be like, "Hey, commissions are open. I'll draw your D and D character. You know, um, your fantasy character. I'll I'll design them and draw them." Um, you know, it'll be a hundred dollars black and white, two hundred dollars color, and oh, okay. So that's that's the example I was just given. Like, so you're saying if it's if it's what would you do the same thing if it was in a portrait? I mean, that's sort of what I just said. You would say, yeah, okay, list it I, for well, a portrait. Yeah, yeah, I would. Like, if you're doing pet portraits or something like that, and you want to essentially open it, be available for a week's time, and however many people you sign up in that week's time. You're going to have, I think, a much better chance filling up all your slots if your prices are just listed because it's more of a product than a service is what you're doing. Okay, can I I add a recommendation there if you're going to do that? Put a range of prices next to Mm -hmm. each one Mm -hmm. instead of what the actual price is because like... Like, like Will was saying, it's, there's such a variety. Mm-hmm. And even some characters are simple and some characters are complicated. Um, some are easy and some are going to be more difficult. So like, you know, black and white D&D character, maybe the range is 50 bucks to 200 bucks, depending on complexity. And if you just write that out, any normal person would say, yeah, that makes mm-hmm. sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. But as far as like freelance work, you're not usually listing, here's my day rate. You know, it, what right. typically happens is someone wants to hire you for, you know, for any sort of job illustrating a picture book or, or, you know, doing character designs for a TV show or something like that. They're going to reach out. They're going to email you and say, hey, we want to know if you have availability for this project. Um, you know, it's from this time to this time. You tell them yes. And this, then they'll say, great. What is your what is your rate? And what they're usually wanting to know is how much do you charge a day? Mm-hmm. And uh, and so what I've done in the past, too, is, and what I currently do is, well, here's my day rate, but we can figure out just a, a, a price for the whole job, the overall job. And mm-hmm. I can give you an estimate so we don't have to, like, keep track of days and things like that. Um, and usually, usually that works out better for both parties because they feel comfortable asking for revisions and I've usually padded it a little bit knowing there'll be revisions and mm-hmm. they don't they know they can easily budget I we we have this much for this artist to create this and that works good for their books and they're not going to be you know have sticker shock when they get the invoice and yeah. and uh and so that's that's one way I think one way to do it mm-hmm. the reason you don't want to charge hourly is is um, 
it's a little I, I think it does lean amateur, right, Lee? Mm-hmm. Like like you you it 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 means you you aren't confident enough in how much time it takes for you to do a certain thing. It's sort of a little bit like they I think the 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 your client feels a little nickel and dimed too. Like, oh yeah, yeah. I spent it's, 30 minutes on this. So I'm going to charge you, you know, 150 for that little thing that I did. Yeah. Right. I mean, I wouldn't hire someone like, and when you, it, you know, if you take your car in, it, they have a shop rate, they have an hourly rate and you say, you know, they say, well, it's, it's going to be parts plus labor. And you're like, and they'll always give you an estimate on what they think. It's, it's probably, we're going to bill it at, you know, an hour and a half, but it usually takes us an hour. So it'll probably be done in an hour and we might only bill you for the, hour but be prepared because it could be an hour and a half so you know you kind of get an idea but i doubt that artists would ever do that so if i was a client i'd be sitting there going well are they going to bill me for 10 hours 20 hours 30 hours mm-hmm. are they are they really working during that time all, all of a sudden it just gets into all kinds of i just want to mm-hmm. know how much i need to know i have a budget i need to know how much it's going to cost to get this thing if it's too much i just won't do it right if it's close we'll negotiate right and and you could put on your your website too. Um, you could say, "Here's the amount of work I get done in a day." So, uh, you hire me for a day. I can I can do, you know, five five sketches, or I can do um, one detailed landscape drawing. Uh, you know, for a week's time, I can do a full color, you know, hero image, um, just so that they can also get an idea of what what they're what they're signing up for because that's that's the other variable it's like okay your day rates you know 450 well what am i getting for a day of work you know Mm -hmm. so um so you might want to do that on there as well it's tough these are these are weird issues i mean it's it's a it's a really weird yeah yeah and 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 don't be if you know if someone's reaching out because they want to work with you don't be afraid of negotiating. Don't be afraid of standing firm on what your prices are. And don't be afraid too to also um, work with them, like uh, work with them on on their price and just say, what's your budget? Well, my budget's $600. And you could say, well, here's what I can give you for $600. And, and yeah, then they exactly get a better idea. idea. Yeah, then they can get a better idea of, of what the market rate is for for work and what you're comfortable doing for that amount um i like to do that with commissions too like i'll at a convention and uh, whenever these happen again <laughs> i plan on doing this <laughs> i'll just say you know uh i'm doing i'm doing black and white drawings for you know 200 bucks right mm-hmm. with with some marker um you know some marker color add to them or something like that i'll just list it 200 bucks and someone will come up to me and be like, 200 bucks? All I have is my budget's like 50 bucks for something. And I said, all right, 50 bucks. I can do a half the size and I'll just, I won't add marker. And they'll be happy to have yeah, they want a small Jake. drawing. Yeah. yeah. They'll have happy to have a small drawing. Um, I'll tell you what, so, though, I mean, I've seen, I've seen David Hone use that same technique and go bring high clients from low to high instead of mm-hmm. from high to low. Cause they, they asked for something and David and, you know, at first they just ask, how much does this thing cost? And mm-hmm. David will say, it's expensive because they're typically asking for, you know, typically a rush job, full color, giant thing, all all these rights. Uh-huh. And David comes back with the full price and they're like, oh man, that's the, we're, that's way out of our budget. And then David's like, well, I can do it. Same thing you're saying. I can, you know, you're, I'll limit your rights. I'll shrink the illustration. We'll mm-hmm. do half, you know, half the size, half, half the scope. And I can do it for that. Exactly like you say. And then, and then most of the time they're like... No, no, it's we really want the big, right. big. We got to do yeah, the big it's gotta one. Got to be done right. And, and he's like, "All right." So he just he just went from five hundred to two thousand or whatever. You know what I mean? And and <laughs> that's and, brilliant. And he's fine with everything in between. And the, and the client doesn't feel gypped because, like like you said, you're working with them and they understand where that you value justified is. your price. Yeah, mm-hmm. I guarantee the anyone listening, the more uh, work you do, the more expert you will become at bidding mm-hmm. and, and pricing your work. Because you'll screw it up, and when you screw it up, it's painful, because you end up working for uh, so much less money, mm-hmm. and uh, 
and you just learn. You won't let that happen to you too much. Right. Do you know there's yeah. a, there's a there's something I've noticed between experienced illustrators and beginners with this that in the when when asked how much something cost the be, the beginner illustrator will basically work either right around or even go a little bit lower than they th think the minimum amount is that they need. You know what I mean? Like I need a hundred bucks. That seems like a lot. I'll sell them. It's 90. Or, you know, they'll, they'll back mm -hmm. off of that number. Whereas the pro will say, Oh man, this is worth a thousand. So I'm going to quote them three and Ugh. start at that number. You know what I mean? And because yeah. and, and it's, it's a really good lesson because the, the amateurs looking to make the minimum, the pro is looking to make the maximum. And, right, um, and most right. of the time people have, the budget is higher than you think it's going to be. Don't mm -hmm. assume what the other person is willing to pay and don't assume what, and, and here's what, how it works out though. Typically is you get into the job and this always happens, even as a pro, almost every job has some weird level of difficulty that we didn't factor in. And so by taking a, a what I, you know, a minimum job of 1500 and if I add a thousand bucks to it, so now that job is 2,500, the client agrees to it, I get into it. And then there's some problem that I run into that it turns it into an actually a $2,500 job. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> rarely, it, rarely does it go as smoothly as you thought it would, as quickly as you thought it would. And, uh, and, and you're just better served that way. So watch out, for, watch out for just shooting at the minimum you need. Pat it in there because something's always going to go wrong. And again, don't assume what your client is willing to pay. It's a good point. Like the, another thing with that is you can scare people off with too little a price, just like you can scare them off with too high a price. And if yeah. you're, if you're coming in super low, all of a sudden you'll scare them because you've just outed yourself as a, as a total noob. And now they're one worried of, that you can even deliver. One of my early, earliest lessons in salesmanship, I guess my grandmother was amazing craft crafter. Like she could paint, she could sew, she could, um, build things. Uh, her and her and my grandpa were like this amazing combo where she had ideas. He was a woodworker. And so she'd, she'd paint something. He'd make the frame for her. She oh, wow. had an idea for like little miniature dioramas and he would do the woodworking to like, and she'd piece them together and all that stuff. So they would do these craft shows and she noticed like if things weren't selling at this particular craft show, she'd go around replace all the prices and just double the price. <laughs> so it would be, you know, $20 for a painting. They're now $40, right? This was back in the sixties. And, uh, and then things would start, things would start selling. And even if you sell less items than the last craft show, you could still make the same amount of money because, uh, you know, because you've doubled, doubled them. So me and Will, I remember, we, me and Will yeah, were talking just, about that too. At the craft fairs, we, mm -hmm. that's exactly how I started selling originals. And at first they were cheap and then I at least doubled the price and they all sold. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird yeah. psychology because I think it's some of these shows too. It's like, there's, there's more factors at play than do I like your artwork? Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's it's, a implied like value when something's expensive. There's a value to it already placed on it that you were mm -hmm. placing on it. it. It actually becomes more valuable have, in a weird, weird way. Have you guys yeah. ever noticed if you give, if you give someone a sketch or a print, if you just give it to them, you'll find it on the ground or you'll find it laying around at your, like they're at your house, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love your artwork. Blah, blah, blah. Well, here, you know, have this. They leave mm -hmm. it behind. Yeah. Why do they leave it behind? <laughs> Dude, that's, that's my, it. that's my buffet analogy. Yeah. Whenever I go, we, we got tickets one time to the Portland Trailblazers, the NBA mm -hmm. team. And, and so, and, and we got these special box seats and stuff. And uh, and it came with all this food, right? You get to have as much food as you want. And, and gourmet level food, but it was in a buffet and there's no limit to it. And man, I had like three or four shrimp before I started wanting to throw the shrimp. <laughs> 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 it's not it's not a great moment for i don't know why when if anytime you're just holding a a, a, a little thing that's that size i just yeah. think i just want to throw it i don't know where that just comes from being like a five-year-old <laughs> i told that tell you i got caught throwing carrots at uh never mind I need to go. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right i'll tell can i tell this little story it's kind of funny um so i was i was out there we had this balcony at my uh, school where I used to teach and, you know, mm -hmm. lunchroom inside. 
And I'm out there on the balcony eating and I'm almost done with, with my, th my lunch. And I've got this little bag of, of those little baby carrots. And so I'm, you know, you get about halfway through the baby carrot bag. You don't want any more carrots at all. Right. And we're, <laughs> we're above the busy street downtown Portland. And so I just threw one at, you know, somebody walking. <laughs> so stupid. Wow, and, I had, and so I dove behind the balcony wall. You know, it's like a half wall. It comes up to about my yeah. waist. And so I dove behind the wall and I came up and I was just having such a good time. So then I, you know, I was picking little groups of people and throwing them. And, uh, and, then, and then I turned around and the whole wall to the, to the kitchen or to the lunchroom there is glass. But I was seeing the reflection. And by the time I got close to it, there's a whole group of people in there just watching me do this like that. <laughs> 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 so embarrassing it was so embarrassing there's no way there's no justification there there's no did they, you can't come. were you teaching there did then? they say what did they say yeah yeah i was a full-time teacher <laughs> this is in were between they classes amused or were they like shaking their heads pretty much the shake in the head kind of thing it was it was like <laughs> nobody said anything here. there was nothing you could say i mean there was nothing That's i could say it just kind of like anything. oh it was it was embarrassing you walk in. sometimes you just gotta throw your your baby carrots guys <laughs> i will say this i had a deadly accuracy with those carrots just saying you walk in did you see how many hits i got did you see that <laughs> Yeah, you're you, judging me right now. And then you but walk that was over at least the, 80% the, hit rate. Then you walk over to the community <laughs> fridge. You pull out someone's drink. You just guzzle it, <laughs> throw it on the floor, and leave. <laughs> Be before this episode, which one of us was most likely, would you guys have predicted, was most likely to throw baby carrots at random people walking on the side? <laughs> definitely. That's a, that's... I'm not proud of it. It's just <laughs> sort of how I roll. But any, oh, so, hey, sorry, to get back to the... If I was served the shrimp on a plate, there's no way I would think about throwing them. But because they were right. sort of free. Right. Mm -hmm. sort anyway, of, did sort you pay for that buffet? No, it, it came, came with, with those box seats. Box thing. It just came with the box seats. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Had you paid for that box seat in that buffet? Oh, yeah. I wouldn't be have, like, yeah. No, I wouldn't be throwing yeah. anything. You're right. Anyway, right. I don't know. How are we here? Let's get off of this. It's <laughs> well, <laughs> it's time to wrap it up anyway. So... I'm going to take us out. Uh, what, what, how, do, how do I take it out again? Oh, S, uh, Three Point Perspective is brought to you by svslearn.com. We're becoming a great illustrator starts. And, and uh, your host, and, yes. <laughs> if, you, if you want to learn how to throw carrots, Lee's actually offering a 10-week course <laughs> on, on how to do baby carrot. Um, you throw and dive. You got to get out of the way. You can't let people catch it. That's just a, just a little taste of what you're going to learn in this, uh, in this course. No, your hosts have been Lee White, Will Terry, Jake Parker. And you can find Lee White's, um, Lee White's stuff at LeeWhiteIllustration.com and also on Instagram at LeeWhiteIllo. Will Terry, you can find his stuff at WillTerry.com and his Instagram is WillTerryArt. And my stuff could be found at MrJakeParker.com and I'm Jake Parker on Instagram. Um Podcast is produced by Daniel Tu, and uh, that's spelled Daniel T U. And you could check out his website, Daniel Tu.co. Uh, special thanks to our SVS producer, David Bro, for all the work that he does, making sure everything runs smoothly here. And a big thanks to Lisa Fott for all the work she does on the social media email front for SVS Learn as well, getting this podcast out to, to everybody. Um, if you want to be a part of this particular discussion, Go check out the svslearn.com forum, free to join, free to participate there. It's just a nice, welcoming community of artists. Share your artwork, get feedback, give feedback, put more into the forum than, than you take out of it. It's going to be a, a wonderful place for you. But we have a topic, we have this particular episode posted, one of the topics, and you can join in the, the discussion there or leave a comment on the YouTube uh, channel because we do post these on YouTube as well. Um, I think that's it. We love hearing feedback on our episodes. We like to see what we're doing good, what we need to improve, you know, what, um, you know, just what you guys think of this. And we'd love any sort of positive feedback left on iTunes as well. So um, I think that's it. And we see you guys next time. <laughs>